<sighs> okay. Well, that light's no good, is it? Here, let's get you over here. All right. How's that? Better? Welcome back to Secondhand Overland. I'm your host, Matt Kester, and we're back in a field in western Montana at the Kester Family Compound. Now, today's video is, uh, well, it's informational in nature. We just put out a ham radio video this week and had a question that has come up a lot, so why not just go ahead and readdress it? And it's something that we talked about in a previous video, but I feel like it's it's worth expounding on more now that some time has passed, okay? And what we're talking about here today is CB versus GMRS versus ham. Which one do you need? Really, the question comes down to where are you gonna use it what purpose are you gonna use it for? And how much effort or resources are you willing to expend to get into using that particular radio service? Basically, these different radio services all have unique features, they all have unique drawbacks to them. And you've gotta look at those three elements when you're deciding which one you're gonna to wanna to use. Now, first up is CB, and I've included MERS in it. And MERS is the, uh, well, I'll put the, there, okay, that's what it is. I can't remember the wording for it. And that's because it's really kind of forgettable. Along with CB, um, MERS, they're both the lowest barrier to entry out of all of these services that we're talking about, meaning that they don't require any kind of licensing, they don't require any kind of testing. You basically just buy the radio and go to town and use it. There are some drawbacks with that and the first and foremost is they are the lowest powered versions of these and you, you could group FRS in with this but I'm not even going to talk about FRS because FRS is child's toys really so let's forget about FRS. <clears throat> CB and MERS they're both lowest they're both the lowest powered uh, general radio that you can use or public radio service that you can use. Uh, they're both limited to, I believe, like two watts total. Now, there are some differences between the two of them. CB is a low power, high frequency AM radio, meaning it uses amplitude modulation when it's sending out a signal. Um, basically, you remember listening to AM radio? And do you remember how the sound quality just was shit? And then when you started listening to FM radio, uh, you were able to get, you know, like stereo, the signal was a lot better, a lot clearer, a lot cleaner. Well, that's the difference here. CB utilizes amplitude modulation, whereas MERS uses frequency modulation. And with MERS and that frequency modulation, you do get a cleaner signal. MERS also uses what's known as VHF, very high frequency, which has a little bit of an advantage over the UHF services that we're gonna talk about in a minute, in that it can kind of bend a little bit around some topography and give you a little bit more range in certain situations. However, when you're only pushing out two watts, that difference is gonna be kinda hard to tell. Moving on, uh, talking about what they're good for, well, CB is really only good for if you need to talk to truckers or you need to find low rent hookers, AKA lot lizards, or you're a lot lizard looking for a trucker. Um, truckers are pretty much the only people that use CBs anymore. And uh, if you ever listen to the scan on channel 19, uh, well, it's truckers bitching about trucker things and it will make you want to rip your eyeballs out. CB's dead unless you are a trucker or a lot lizard, okay? MERS is good for talking to Walmart staff because if you're ever out and about and you have a MERS radio and you drive by a Walmart, you'll hear them talking inside because that's what they use. Uh, I don't know anyone else who actively uses MERS as a communication means. Um, I do keep it programmed into my dual band radios that are able to program that just for a oddball situation where I actually need to use it, but uh, it's effectively not that great, and especially when it lacks the repeater capability of other services that we're gonna talk about in a minute. These are the lowest barrier to entry setup. So if you just need to get the cheapest, easiest way to have two radios to talk to somebody over a short distance, I'm talking like not more than a mile, two miles, these are good options for you. But if you need to go beyond that, or you need to talk to more people, or you need to have the ability to talk to, say, the wider audience or wider range of people out there, uh, 
aside from truckers and lot lizards and Walmart employees, you're going to be hard pressed with this service. Moving on, uh, talking about GMRS. Well, GMRS is, is kind of the next step up and with it comes a little bit tighter of a barrier of entry. I'm about to get rained on, I gotta go. <clears throat> Boy, I'm glad we got out of there. Okay, the next one we're gonna move on to here is gonna be GMRS, obviously. And, well, GMRS has a mid-grade barrier to entry. It's got a single license fee. It's $35 now, finally, that the federal government got their shit together and lowered it. So for $35, you're gonna get a license that allows you to use the GMRS airwaves, and it also allows anyone in your immediate family to use those same airwaves for up to 10 years. And it's no test required. It's an over-the-counter license. It's really not over a counter. You gotta go jump through the GMRS test, as I like to call it, which is the hoops to try to get that license because it's 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 kind of a little complicated with the sign up there's a couple of steps you got to step through it's really not that bad though takes a little bit of time mine took a few days to process but uh well i have a license for 10 years and 35 dollars and everybody in my immediate family can use it what gmrs does that really differentiates itself uh, and allows it to be a very powerful tool for those $35 is that it uses a UHF signal in the 462 megahertz to the 467 megahertz spectrum. And within that spectrum, you get eight channels that are available for a frequency power of up to 50 watts in mobile or five watts on a handheld. But the key feature with that that makes GMRS so amazing and so powerful is that it allows you to use repeaters. And what repeaters are, they're a standalone radio on a mountaintop or top of a tower somewhere that receive a signal from one radio, repeat that signal out all the way around so that people in a wider area can hear you and you can communicate. Those repeaters in some places are also linked into a network. So uh, for instance, the Southwest GMRS network that uh, uh, we like to use and we like to talk on sometimes. Uh, it's got linked repeaters as far south as the Mexico border all the way up to Denver and you key up on one of them and you can talk to anywhere along the line. And that's kind of what's bringing GMRS to the forefront is that power. It's also an FM system and it uses UHF. So it is as good as the line of sight that you get anywhere. I've I've used a radio to talk over 200 miles from a mountaintop to another repeater away. Uh, just using a 5 watt handheld and it's that power and it's that relative low barrier to entry that has made this thing become more popular among a few communities. Um, the outdoors, off-roaders especially have started to adopt GMRS and it's become kind of a standard when you go on a trail ride somewhere. People used to use CBs, well now we're talking on GMRS and that's because of the features it offers. You've also got access to things like CTCSS and DCS tones, squelch tones, which allow you to filter out unwanted conversation and only hear what you really want to hear. And these are all features that um, are kind of handed down to GMRS from the next step up that we're going to talk about in a minute but it gives you these really nice, powerful, essential features with a minimum cost of entry. Some of the drawbacks to this, well, you've only got eight channels that you can talk on repeaters on, and in places where there is a lot of traffic, well, the bandwidth starts to get jammed up, and because you have that power available to 50 watts, you can really throw a signal over a wide area and really interfere with what people are doing. This is the most heavily growing segment in two-way radio right now, so it probably would behoove the government to maybe start to think to expand that bandwidth and allow for a little bit more traffic as congested as this is starting to get. Now we got hail. One thing that a lot of GMRS radios have done is they've incorporated the ability to monitor other spectrums like ham radio or other VHF, UHF signals, which is kind of beneficial, but at the same token, they aren't able to talk out because as a part 95 GMRS radio, they're only able to transmit on approved GMRS frequencies. And that's kind of the limitation to GMRS is that it just only has 
so many channels that you can talk on and if you get somewhere where there is a, a higher density of users or a higher density of repeaters, you start to run into some problems with some crosstalk and that might lead you to want to go to our next service which is amateur ham radio and amateur or ham radio is actually well it's 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 a wide 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 world of radio things that you can do and it's like the sky is the limit and there are three tiers and three classifications, but for most of what we're gonna talk about, we're just gonna talk about the lowest level, which is the technician class, which opens up the world of uh, 70 centimeter and two meter ham radio analog bands, because, um, well, that's kinda all we're concerned with right now. But further down the line, you've got things like digital, you've also got the higher frequency bands, which will allow you to talk around the world, but we're not concerned about that right now. We're just concerned about the technician license portion of that. And well, this is the highest barrier to entry of all the radio services. You're gonna have to pay a fee. You're gonna have to sit and take a test that is proctored so that you're not cheating uh, in order to get that license that will allow you to transmit on certain bands and certain frequencies in the ham radio spectrum. But along with that privilege comes access to a wider world of repeaters. There's just more ham radio to either 70 centimeter or two meter repeaters all over the place. Like I'm here visiting my uncle right now in Western Montana. There isn't a GMRS repeater within at least 150 miles or 200 miles of my current location, but there are numerous ham radio repeaters um, that I'm able to access through repeater book and that's just because they're that prevalent. Also, it allows you to use not just UHF, but it allows you to use a higher power VHF, which uh, as we said earlier, VHF has some advantages in being able to bend around topography a little bit better and get a signal out, especially when you're here like in the mountains. This also opens your world up to some other services that you might find quite useful, especially if you're needing to get some off-grid communication back to people who might not be in the radio loops. Uh, technologies like APRS, where you can use land stations that are around you called digipeters to basically communicate back through the internet to other people. Like, I can use APRS to literally send texts to people and let them know I'm okay. I can also send my location. Uh, and also when I turn my beacon on, it actually beacons me to APRSFI where anybody in the world who has my call sign can pull up my location if I so choose to share it, which is a very handy feature because you know your spot messenger and your satellite messenger and your inreaches? Well, they have some limitations to them in that they only communicate with the satellite overhead, which then only communicates to a dispatch department who then will communicate to search and rescue looking for you. APRS, well, most search and rescue outfits already have APRS, and APRS actually sends a signal out directly from where you're at, and anybody who's monitoring APRS can hear it, so it cuts the middleman out of the loop. Should you ever have a problem, it might make it easier for search and rescue to find you. Um, also, there's things like windmail, where you can send mail, or is it windlink? There are email through radio programs where you can send text emails out, which obviously is very handy when you're somewhere back in the woods and need to communicate with someone, there you go. And that's that's really what it comes down to. It's just three different tiers that have three different unique sets of features and advantages. And essentially, they go from the easier barrier of entry with lower features to a higher barrier of entry with the most amount of features. And it's finding your way across there that you need to know to find which radio service is going to be right for you. And also, it just comes down to who do you need to communicate with? Do you just need to communicate with your kid down the street at the park? Well, you can get away with a CB handheld or a MERS handheld and, and be just fine. Uh, or a GMRS handheld if you want to step it up and spend that $35. And then, you know, your family could take advantage of repeaters and repeater clubs and whatnot. Or if you need to go off-roading and your buddies are all using GMRS like everybody else, then there's a viable option for you. But if you're needing the most versatile communication suite, uh, then you're going to want to look at getting a technician ham radio license. And um, well, I'll put a link in the description below to a video I made talking about how I got my ham license with only studying for a day. The test isn't 
super hard. It can be challenging. I'm not going to lie to you. But uh, it's nothing that most people can't overcome with just a little bit of study material. And I've got some ideas in that video. And like I said, I'll link back to it. That's that. That is what I see is the differences or the reasons why you might want to choose one of those services over the other. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And uh, if you're new here, go ahead and hit subscribe. Check us out at all the usual suspects, Secondhand Overland on Instagram and Facebook. I'm Matt Kester. Until next time, be good.